Hello, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Talking with Teachers on your Barnstable Educational Television Station, B2B TV, Channel 22 in Barnstable. I'm your station coordinator, Jim Gilbert, here today with Barnstable High School history teacher. I got it right. Barnstable High School history teacher, Jeremy Shea, uh, and local legend as well. Um, Thank you so much for being here. Hey, thanks for having me. It's a lovely place, nice lights, nice cameras, nice people. Where can you go wrong? You don't seem nervous by the cameras and the lights. <laughs> I'm not, no. <laughs> um, tell us a little bit to start about what you, classes you're teaching this year and the grade levels that you're directly involved with. Yeah, so this year I only have juniors and seniors in my classes. I have two sections of Global Issues for Global Citizens, a magnificent elective that everyone should take. Uh, and then I have three sections of uh, US 2, so okay. sort of modern American history. Okay. How's it going? It's great. It's, uh, I will say it's, it's a weird start to the year, as probably everyone's been having. It's interesting having everyone get back, and last year was the strangest of all. And uh, just trying to get a sense of where I'm at, where students are at. You know, we're all kind of readjusting to being back in school and and having the masks and everyone's in the rooms. And so it's, I think I, I try to start the years pretty slowly of mm. not super academically rigorous to begin, just to really feel more comfortable. Mm. Uh, but it's great. I have a great set of students. They're all awesome. So, you know, we, we, uh, we have a good time. If you could describe, you know, where your students are at, where are they at right now? I'd say everyone's a bit uh, tired is probably a, a good vibe that everyone's been feeling. Uh, the seven classes is a lot of classes. Yeah. So just trying to get a sense of this new schedule. For me, that's been, you know, Mondays and Fridays. It's like, all right, we're about to start and class is over. So mm -hmm. just trying to get a kind of a, a, a handle of this new rhythm of the year, which has been a bit harder, I'd say, than other years, just with the schedules and shifting from day to day. So I think for me, that's been hard. For students, that's been hard as well. So uh, I've heard some people mention that they like seeing everybody on Mondays and Fridays, although those blocks are shorter. You do get to touch base with everybody the first day and the last day of the week. Um, and then there's five blocks, Tuesdays, Wednesdays, and thir Thursdays, for those who don't know about what's happening here at Barnesville High School. Seven blocks, Mondays and Fridays, five blocks, Tuesdays through Thursdays. So what's your, you know, obviously the blocks are shorter, but touching base on Monday and Friday, how's that working for you? It's, it's taken time to adjust, really, for me, the planning of what activities are we doing and really trying to get a sense of what we can do in that time frame. It is nice to see everyone. Um, I'd say by the end of the day, everyone's pretty tired. <laughs> like last vlog yesterday, it was a lot of kind of glazed eyes. And uh, the rainy day didn't help either. Sure, so yeah. it's, it's, uh, it's taking some adjustment, too. But I like, I mean, I like seeing everyone. It's so much better than having students on the screen and some in front of you, like that's why I'm a teacher, is I like hanging out with students. Yeah. So it's great having everyone back in the class and it's great being able to see them more frequently. So overall, I think it's gonna be a, a, a good way of, of setting up the year, but it's gonna take some time still to, to get used to how, to how to run it. So let's talk a little bit about how you became a teacher. Um, where did you go to high school? Well, uh, I went to Sandwich High School. I betrayed the Blue Knights. Uh, but yeah, I grew up in Sandwich. Both my parents were teachers, so this was the last thing I ever wanted to do. Right. Um, Yet here you are. But here I am, <laughs> and loving it. It's, it's the best. I've never hated a day at work, which is great. It's a, it's a blessing as a, as a job. I know a lot of people get stressed out at their jobs. They're like, oh, I gotta go to work today. Mm. I love going to work. So yeah, yeah Sandwich, I was there. Uh, and it was a great time. I love Sandwich. I still live in Sandwich, mm. but um, is there an uh, is there an educational memory from that time that either you know obviously your parents were teachers, so that was in the house. But you know, when did you catch the bug, so to speak? Well, I've always loved learning. I just am a very curious person, so I always was curious in. 
National Geographic's were like the thing as a kid that I would love to just flip through and learn about different cultures and uh, want to travel. And I was in the Model UN Club in, in high school and just sitting there, I remember the first day, and there's 100, it was 120 kids in the club, so it was a big club. And everyone's a different country and they're arguing about whatever topic it was. And it was just such a cool environment to be sitting in of a Monday night from 7 to 9 p.m. that that many high schoolers would get together and just be willing to sit and debate, you know, the, the independent struggles in various nations. And it was that that really got me interested in it. Uh, it's what I majored in in college was international studies. So that became really my love. I was the, the head of the club for a couple of years. Uh, traveled down to New York, went to the UN, and met with government officials down there, and it really kind of set me off on my my adventures beyond. And here you get to teach global lessons yeah. for global citizens. Exactly. Um, where did the undergrad come from? So I went to Fairfield University, uh, Connecticut, in Connecticut, a yep. lovely, beautiful campus north of New York City. So about an hour on the on the train down to the city but right by the water, uh, and the campus is very spread out, lots of green spaces, and I love the outdoors. I grew up uh, next to a conservation area in Sandwich, so I would roam through the forest. Thornton Burgess, one of the original kind of nature personalities in America, first radio person that got on and really educated the world in America about nature and the environment and animals, so I've always loved the outdoors, and Fairfield certainly had a, a lot of great outdoor space, which I loved, but. And who's, who, who was the influence there? What was the, you know, that continued this journey for you? Yeah, I had a professor, uh, Dr. Crawford, who, uh, <laughs> I had him for an anthropology class and cultural anthropology. And I was always fascinated with cultures and, and different ways that humans have devised to live. And I remember sitting in class, I was a freshman. I had a big beard, because Fairfield was very preppy, and I am not a very preppy person, despite my tie I wear every day. <laughs> uh, a lot of pop collars. So I was, I was known as kind of the, the, the token hippie on campus. Mm -hmm. um, and I would always volunteer, because I love learning. And one day he, uh, I'm, Maybe I shouldn't tell the story. I'll edit it. Uh, he looked at me and goes, the effing hippie's the only one answering questions in this class. <laughs> After that, I took four more classes with him. I've gone to visit. I've stayed with his family. Right. And he just really, the way he told stories, I loved. And I think that's the uh, what makes a good teacher in many ways is a good storyteller, that the picture you're painting, you're setting the scene, you're you're really getting the students invested in whatever topic you're talking about. And he was such a great storyteller. He was funny uh, and really an engaging personality, and which really encouraged me to, to leave. And he was like, you've got to study abroad, uh, which I did, which was fun. And where did you go? I was in Botswana in oh. southern Africa. So I spent five months uh, in Haberone, which was the capital of the city, and uh, helped set up a Model UN conference with students at the university, uh, one of whom, who's now, she's a, a top politician in Botswana. I met with UNICEF, I met with the UN, uh, government officials that looked at development programs for youth, and uh, I did a homestay out in a village, and you know, it, it was as not Cape Cod as you could imagine. Mm. And for me, that was really the reason I chose it. I had a lot of friends that were going to Spain and Italy and Australia, which, you know, no fault to them, but I really wanted something that was different. And being the only white student in a lecture hall of 150 students and having the professor be like, my white son, and me being <laughs> like, I am very conspicuous <laughs> right now. Uh, you know, it's, it's, a, it's an experience that I'm glad I had, and it was really formative to where I went afterwards, which was fun. Did you still have the beard in Botswana? Yes. You, you weren't inspired to <laughs> shave the beard. It was hot. I mean, it's in the Kalahari Desert. Uh, the My friends that were from Botswana, um, they didn't like it. Not a lot of beards in, right. in the country, so I get a lot of ribbing uh, from, from my <laughs> friends there. <laughs> Eventually, I did shave it once. They're like, oh, wow, look at you. So Right, there's yeah. your face. Yeah. <laughs> um, so... Sandwich, Mass, Fairfield, Connecticut, Botswana, Africa. 
What, what came next? I moved to Central America. Okay. So I, after graduation, I was a double major in international studies and political science. I still, it's 2010, middle of financial crisis, mm. uh, really not a great job market. But I'd always wanted to do the Peace Corps. And when I was living in Botswana, I was traveling a, lot, a bunch, went to South Africa, Mozambique, uh, went into Zimbabwe. I met some Peace Corps volunteers, and they were very mixed in their reviews of either I love it, this is an incredible experience, to I live alone in the middle of nowhere, and the people that I'm working with don't like me. Mm. Which didn't seem like something like 50-50 shot of terrible or great. Yeah. So um, I applied for a Jesuit volunteer corps where you live with other volunteers in another country, uh, which I thought would be a little safety and security more so than being alone. So yep. uh, I moved to Belize, Punta Gorda, Belize. It's a small village in the south of the country. Uh, and I lived there for two years, didn't come back to the U.S. once. I taught at a primary school, I taught reading and ran a school library and lived uh, about a hundred feet from the Caribbean. So I was right on the mm. water in an old uh, wood house that's been torn down since. But you would see in the fall the thunderstorms rolling across the Caribbean from Guatemala and Honduras in the distance. And it was, you could hear howler monkeys in the morning from the jungle. Uh, traveled a lot in the area, but it was it was incredible. It was it was a, a great two years, and I was happy to come back. But uh, it was it was a great. I loved it. I learned a lot about myself, <laughs> uh, a lot about how to kind of subsist and very simplicity, right. simplistic way of living. Sure. Uh, Henry David Thoreau is like my my guru of life. Um, so I read Walden a lot, and yep. really the the way of getting what you need out of life in a, in a more simplistic manner. Uh, as you were telling the story, I thought of Walden and a much, bar, much larger pond, but still the <laughs> same idea. Yeah. Um, OK, so get us to Barnstable High School. What, what, when did you start here? How long have you been here? What were the final steps to yeah. get you in a classroom here at Barnstable High School? So I get back from Botswana. I'm or Belize, I get back from Belize, I'm like, I don't know what I'm doing with life. I was working at the YMCA. Uh, I've worked at Camp Linden and Sandwich for since 2006. Um, running ropes groups and, and uh, really team building activities in the fall of that year. And I was like, I actually really like this. And what I was sad about working with those groups is you'd meet a group of kids and they'd be gone that day. And I was like, that's, I'd rather have a longer <laughs> uh, experience with, with kids. So I, I applied for a master's program, went to Providence College got my uh, master's in secondary ed, taught up in Lawrence during that for two years at a high school up there. And after graduating, applied for many jobs. Of got course. hired at the intermediate school, taught there for two years, and then I've been here for five years. So it's, it's the most fun. I love it. I'm down in 1706, the greatest classroom in the world. Got a great group of teachers across the hall and around me that are, you know, first colleagues now friends and right. very supportive of your vinyl. Oh yeah, record collection in the hallways. Yeah, I, I, I have my record player that uh, play during passing time. Get the music. You know, high school can be a, a, a objectively rough experience at times. You know, it's it's a lot going on. And sometimes a nice tune in the in the hallway makes life a little better. I. Concur in spades, as they say. Um, how does what? Uh, I love hosting the teachers and talking with them because we get these rich stories of how you end up here. You know, our students may think it's just they might not. They have. They probably have no idea how our teachers land in their classroom up in front of them, telling them what to do and all the rules that they need to adhere to and reject our you know mentorship for and whatnot um, but how do you get your story and your arc of life and being proud of who you are as a teacher and all of that stuff that you accomplish how do you get that into a history class how does that become part of your education of young people yeah and we as history teachers, it is about storytelling, and I think that's a piece of why I like the subject. But 
I tell a lot of stories. I've traveled a lot. I have a lot of photographs. I'm a photographer. I used to teach digital photography. And I also remember very vividly what life was like in high school. So I think for me, I can really empathize with where students are at and understand that there's days where looking out at the crowd, it's like everyone's burnt out right now. And I think working at a summer camp very much has that, is you're doing an activity with 20 kids and it's not going well, you stop doing it and you try something else. So I think the ability to, to gauge a room, to get a sense of what's going on, but also just to, I love hearing the ideas and opinions of students. Socrates' whole method of teaching, of listening to the students, and his whole thing was collectively as a whole, the group of students in front of me knows far more than I do. And tapping into that knowledge and hearing those ideas and opinions and validating those thoughts and feelings, I think is, for me, why I like coming to school. But also for students is often, I've had kids say, like, Mr. Shea, the only one that talks to us like we're people. Mm. And I, I can't say that's true, <laughs> but... For me, that's why I love being a teacher is you meet so many fascinating students that have so many interests and ideas, and drawing those out of them is the fun part. And part of it, too, is sharing myself of like, hey, these are some things that I've gone through. Here's some struggles that I've yeah. had. Here's some adventures I've been on. And, you know, telling those stories helps other people want to share their own stories. It's, it's a challenge, right, because they come through the door and there's, I, I, there's just the mood that people are telling you what to do and that you might not have opportunities or you might not know all of your opportunities. And as an educator in the classroom, it's your job to en enlighten them to that all the opportunities that can happen. You don't have to go to college. You can take different routes. You can, you know. So how do you know? Let's wrap up with this. How do you know when you're getting through? How do you know when you've affected a student? That is hard to say in that every kid is obviously different. And I have so many interests. Like I love nature. I love art. I am curious in theater and I've tried, I've played five varsity sports in high school. So for any educator and anyone that works with kids, it's the connections. How do you make those connections? What are those things that anyone can say, oh, I have that in common with you? And even if it's something little, that then opens up a, a relationship of there's a commonality, there's a, a place where you can meet. And that's like, as parents who are educators, has been a, a wonderful gift for me of hearing what was working for them. I mean, my dad taught sixth grade. He's been invited to kids' weddings. And, you know, they really focused on those relationships and how to build connections because they knew that as an educator you couldn't do otherwise. I mean, my dad got on international news for promoting fun in school. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the commissioner of education is like, you shouldn't be having fun. And he fought back. was like, no, they should be having fun. This is how you learn. This is how right. you, you know, if you are coming into a room and it just stresses you out and it's, it's just focused on pure knowledge, then you forget about all the other pieces of what it is to be human, which is curiosity and, and laughter and, and fun and food and drink and music. And if you can incorporate all of those things into a room, then I think you're going to be successful. That said, there's certainly students that don't like my style of teaching. <laughs> I'm, I'm a bit uh, more lackadaisical and, you know, I'm, I'm not... Eccentric. <laughs> yeah, eccentric <laughs> is a great word, uh, which I think people that like a, a certain uh, routine, maybe that's it's not a, right. uh, a situation that's in their wheelhouse. But I'd say overall, uh, people like coming to class, and I think that's where it, it all starts. If you like coming into the room and you feel comfortable there, then the educational exploration can begin. I think it's so important that, 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 we, that we know, or that I think it's so important that the students know we've been like them 
and they can be like us, or you know, just like that there is that common place, or it's not just we're separate, I do this, you do that, and we communicate over a piece of paper or a test or whatever, that there's, there's real connection there. Um, thank you so much for your wonderful answers, Jeremy. Hey, I greatly welcome. appreciate you telling the story of, of how you got here, and yeah. we're very glad to have you here at Barnesville High School and bring that energy to the classrooms for our students. I love being here. Thanks for having me. It's a glorious space. You have nice curtains, nice lights. <laughs> and a mug of water. And a mug, yeah. <laughs> I didn't even sip from it once, but I'm, I assume it's, it's very hydrating. <laughs> uh, you've been watching Talking with Teachers. I'm Jim Gilbert, your station coordinator for Barnstable Education Television. Again, thank you, Barnstable High School history teacher Jeremy Shea.